Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Lifespeed webinar series. My name is Stephanie. I'll be around for the entire webinar here um, to facilitate any questions that you guys might have. We do expect that this webinar is going to take the entire hour, um, but we will be taking those questions live as we go. So if you would like to ask our host anything during the presentation, go to the questions box to the right hand side of your screen and click on that button to type. Our host today joining us again is Bob Payne presenting on managing dependencies with the portfolio alignment wall, a very hot topic right now. Um, and remember to submit those questions as we go along and we'll have a live Q&A when we close as well. Um, with that, I think we're ready to get going. Over to you, Bob. Great. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, yes, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, portfolio alignment walls and uh, it uh, builds off of the visual management uh, systems talk that it, webinar that I gave a while back. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, we do have a reasonable amount of material to get through. So uh, with that, I uh, want to welcome you all. I'm, I'm uh, been with Lifespeed now for quite a long time, and I'm also the um, the chair of the Agile DC conference, and, and look forward to uh, meeting you in person uh, if I've not already uh, in one of those two capacities. Okay, let's get started. Um, so we have uh, we have this um, idea um, that has been around for quite some time. And that is uh, the use of visual management systems. Um, visual management systems uh, really are um, tools uh, that are used to manage and display work uh, visibly. So the talk today is going to be about a particular type of visual management systems that we use uh, and a lot of Agile teams use. Um, and it's something very similar is used in um, SAFE. Uh, during their PI planning, but that is a portfolio alignment wall. And for those of you that are familiar with the um, Agile Manifesto, uh, you know that there's an individuals and interactions over processes and tools, uh, and I'm a firm believer in that. So anytime I um, advocate the use of a tool or put uh, meeting processes in place, it is to drive the uh, in, the interactions uh, and increase the the um, the number and the quality of the in, interactions between people trying to deliver value on a team. Um, so here's a little quote from Stuart Liff: Imagine organizations where the phys physical plant honors the mission, celebrates employees, shares information holds people accountable, shapes the outside worldview, and helps drive performance. It would be an organization which uses visual management. And if you're interested in uh, Stuart's work, you can certainly look him up. He's a big advocate of lean visual management systems. Um, quite often, uh, organizations struggle with, um, with aligning the work of teams, um, agile teams, uh, within a larger portfolio. Uh, and I want to tell you the teams are doing the best that they can. Uh, what we often lack are the processes and tools above the teams to facilitate um, work intake, um, dependency management, uh, view of the portfolio, um, man managing WIP so that we're not uh, trying to do too many things at once organizationally. and. Team level planning uh, is reasonably well understood in the context of Agile. Uh, you know, we have um, release planning, sprint planning, uh, replanning at the daily standup, a sprint review for tracking progress of the teams every few weeks. And, and we see this pattern of team level planning across all Agile methods. Um, where I think many um, people have started to look to safe, uh, disciplined agile delivery, uh, less some of the scaling frameworks is how do we do um, both strategic planning organizationally um, and cross team planning at the more tactical delivery. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, 
the use of a portfolio uh, alignment wall, which is a term that I coined, a PAW, if you will, um, to allow organizations to understand how their roadmap is um, tracking into the organizational vision for that portfolio and how teams are integrating their work, uh, managing dependencies, and trying to deliver um, in an aligned, coordinated way to maximize uh, the value of the releases that are coming out of those um, many multiple teams. Um, now, this is a this is a wall which is uh, covering a huge amount of work uh, with the merger of Delta and Northwest. Uh, and I recently had um, a gentleman in my class that said, "Oh, holy heck! Um, I worked on that board. I was an aviation." Um, consultant, and I, I'm like, it was so cool to uh, to run into someone that had ac actually worked on this board, uh, and they said uh, it was a massive undertaking, and they really used this board for trying to get their initial plan together uh, and to sort of visualize where things were coming in, um, and um, and what parts of their organizations were working. So for example, if along this middle, you see all these light blue um, post-it notes, those are all uh, loyalty programs. Um, and we, when you see towards the end um, over, uh, over here, we see this long vertical, you know, these, these sort of vertical lines here. Um, that uh, was when the organization was planning on doing a lot of outward bound um, uh, communications. So they were planning their major communication pushes. Uh, and you, as you can imagine, each one of these stickies might represent, um, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands um, of hours of work, uh, just a massive, massive program. And why would they use a visual management wall like this? Well, because planning this work and understanding the scope um, at any given time, you know, um, all of the research that's happening out here, you know, delivering on the those programs in the middle and then communicating and closing out uh, the merger uh, efforts as they get to the end. You know, there's a lot of horse trading that needed to happen across those many uh, organizational parts. So really something like this allowed people to uh, walk up to a board, talk to each other, move things around and brainstorm in a much more rapid way than you could using another tool. Now you can also be absolutely sure that there was an electronic backup of this in this, you know, uh, you know billion dollar uh, merger. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, agile teams and, and and these portfolio alignment walls, um, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the reasons that I came up with the portfolio alignment wall. Um, I happen to be in a working in an organization with a fairly large program, and I was in the um, portfolio status meeting, and it was status, status, status. You know, we have. Uh, you'd hear things uh, said like line 213 of the integrated master schedule, 96.7% complete. You know, we'll see about that. Um, you know, they're realigning and rebaselining activities to, uh, oops, not key, but keep milestone five on track. What was really happening is the teams were getting a lot of pressure to try to pull that time in. Um, and a lot of backdoor dealings where trade-offs, the real work of the portfolio was done in the back room or in the hallways when, when uh, two project managers or scrum masters would happen to run into somebody. We were just reporting status. This needed to turn into a working session where status was a secondary output in the same way that a daily stand-up is a working meeting for the team to understand where they are what's blocking them to do a quick replan and status um, should be at least in scrum a secondary outcome of that meeting so we wanted to uh, move from this sort of strategic status talk 
to strategic doing. Let's actually turn these into working sessions. Um, how can people make trade-offs uh, and make those trade-offs visible to everyone as they're uh, as they're being made? How can we um, make decisions and move quickly? Um, quite often, those decisions are painful, but we still need to move quickly. So we said we needed a new managed model for the for that meeting and for how that team worked together. Um, you know, we need to be a traffic cop uh, to make sure that. Um, teams aren't um, in conflict with each other, that they're aligned with the appropriate release um, uh, releases. We had to take those large projects and chunk them up into smaller pieces and create working sessions to manage the work at all levels. And here we were talking about team level, program portfolio, and executive level. Uh, we wanted to create a regular cadence of uh, delivery, create some sort of rational work intake process, uh, and then have the meetings uh, and the processes to enforce all of the above so that we can create a flow of value that is continuously delivered in the organization. Now, as you know, um, most portfolios, um, there people are trying to do too much. Um, so agile methods at the team level try to gain speed and quality by limiting the work and process. Um, and portfolios need to do the same. Uh, one of the things that visualizing the work um, does is lets us know how many things we're starting. Um, some of you, if you saw my visual management system, uh, saw this uh, chart where this was a large organization, different lines of business, um, and, you know, tracking work a year out, um, you know, three months, uh, three quarters, uh, six months, three months, one month out, uh, and then in the center, uh, all of the work that was in progress. Now, we specifically made this um, chart because the space in the middle is limited. We needed to make sure that the workload was balanced so that we could get things done. You'll quite often hear people say, uh, stop starting uh, and start finishing without fo focusing on getting something done, uh, trying to task switch between many multiples of things. Um, you know, we can't get stuff done. Um, so quite often we have to visualize project traffic, um, you know, we, you know, what projects are in planning, what are currently in delivery, what are out to the build organization, um, and uh, are those deployed? Um, here's another, um, another fairly large portfolio across multiple teams and multiple releases. Um, now, the, the example I'm going to use is one that um, uh, was really the first portfolio line wall I built. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, how we built it uh, and why we did, um, uh, why we built it the way that we did. But first, I want to start um, a little bit. Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about a little bit of theories of visual management. Um, uh, I really like this acronym TIP as you're designing any um, visual management system or any team board. Uh, and that stands for token, the physical item on the wall that represents something, or on, in this case, on the paw that represents something. Um, on those tokens, and you can think of those as cards, um, you have an inscription. Uh, what do we write? Um, what uh, are there little um, symbols or icons or tokens uh, that we might use, um, you know, what's physically on the card, written uh, or in, in visually indicated in some way, and the space in which they're placed. You know, if you're making a, a grid um, like this, um, you know, the rows represent something, and, and in this case, the columns represented time. So you've got the, the token, and let me get a pen. 
You've got, you know, a physical card. Uh, we have different colored cards. So the token colors uh, made, it, made a difference. Uh, you've got the inscription, like what is written on a card. Um, we have these little stickers down here. Um, and then we have other visual indicators on cards to represent things. So those are the inscriptions. And then physically, where is that card uh, within this grid? Our rows, and we'll get back to this when I do that, uh, when I talk in a little more deeply. The rows, whoops, um, rows represented um, a line of business effort uh, that was going on. Uh, the columns represented really a two-week period. We had uh, some scrum teams with aligned sprints. Um, and the actual cards themselves either represented a dependency um, or a release of features. And I'll get uh, into that a um, uh, little bit more when we go into depth. So think token, inscription, and placement uh, on that grid when you're thinking about or designing um, visual manage, visual management um, walls or other indicators that you're going to be using for visual management. So, um, in in general, right, we've got the tokens themselves. Uh, quite often, those can be cards. They represent either the re release of something, some other. Uh, item that's being delivered, some piece of value. They might re represent a dependency between teams. Uh, they might represent um, a milestone uh, in, in some way. And um, many um, times, uh, portfolio line walls will have these um, three major components, what I would call, whoops, let me use a different color to draw. Um, um, so, you know, when is a feature done uh, and ready for release from our portfolio? What are, what are some milestones that we might have? Maybe it's the delivery of a design to another dependent team or, or conversation around that or a, or a conference. Um, and then we also want to indicate any incremental delivery. So the delivery of um, some piece of the system to another um, piece, uh, to another team. Um, on those cards, we might identify who is the team that is responsible for that delivery of that feature finalizer, the milestone, or some increment of delivery. And are there dependencies with other cards on the wall? Um, and certainly those were features of the um, portfolio alignment walls uh, that I typically work with organizations to develop. So um, when you think about a token, you know, you, you or a card on that wall, so color, uh, that can represent, um, that's something that you can see from a long distance away. For example, a yellow card for finalizing a particular release or feature. Blue for incremental delivery and possibly green for non-code milestones. And maybe a red um, indicator um, on that token if there's a uh, block, uh, some sort of blocker for that. Um, you can also use the shape of these tokens. Um, you know, is it a rectangle? Do you have, um, you know, maybe a stop sign? Uh, for blockers, maybe a diamond for milestones. Uh, those are visible from a distance. You might even have indicators of people, um, uh, you know, the, an avatar or a picture of a person uh, attached to the card to indicate who's uh, working on it. Um, so think about what attributes you might need uh, when you're building a wall. And we talked about these uh, possible examples uh, in a in a in a on a wall that's showing features being delivered um, uh, when we're delivering a little bit of dependency those incremental deliveries and when that whole thing is done and releasable um, so inscriptions what's on the card do you have some some you know a, a name that describes what it is 
Um, is there a more in-depth description on the card? You might have an item ID, because most of these walls either are electronic or there's a physical representation um, that you may want to tie back to for the details. Um, do you indicate dependencies, teams? Um, and don't just use, you know, don't, just use these because I say, you know, these might be things you want to. Think about what you need in your context um, for the cards on your uh, portfolio alignment walls. And I, and I find that teams need to experiment with this um, uh, to, uh, to tune it, uh, to get it to fit your particular context. Um, placement. Um, you know, how are you going to use your rows and columns? Or are you using that, that circular sort of bullseye format? Are you using quadrants of some sort to represent uh, something? Is there, is the, um, you know, how, how does it physically relate to the wall and the visual management system that you're building? Now, quite often the rows represent dependent units of value. Now, what does that mean? Well, um, it can be uh, it could be team delivery. That uh, you know, maybe you have a row for per team. You know, maybe you have a row per um, business unit with multiple teams in it. Uh, maybe you have a row that is cross organizational, and uh, the row represents the a value. Um, that is seen by the customer, a customer journey and the different teams uh, and project work that need to be covered. Columns, um, you know, are typically uh, representative of time, but you might have a different um, structure for yours. Uh, you might have a column be um, a release or, you know, uh, some other way of pivoting the um, that uh, data. I also see sometimes there are clusters of rows that all um, line up with something. So, you know, a major um, grouping of rows or columns and then, then particular rows and columns. So the design of that is really relatively flexible and you need to think about how you want to uh, build your board. Now, I'm going to um, pause there for a second and see if anybody has a question on just sort of the the structures of some of these and then I want to go into um, uh, more of the cadence and to walk through uh, one particular portfolio alignment wall uh, that I designed. Yeah, we do actually have a couple of questions here um, and I'll uh, I'll just give you okay. just a few. Um, First question, is it inherently true that my PAW will help my team or individual whip limits? Uh, no, uh, it, can, it can show you the information, um, uh, but organizationally you will have to uh, get uh, commitment and buy into um, to managing WIP so that you're able to deliver. But in, in the same way that Agile quite often will, um, will will um, surface problems that you have relatively early, uh, but it, 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 it is those individuals and their interactions, the people fundamentally need to um, commit to limiting the whip or solving uh, dependency problems. Okay. Um, and then the other question that's come in is, at what point does the inscription of a card or token become too detailed? In other words, how much detail is too too much detail? Gosh, that's that's like saying, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it really depends on your team. Uh, and what I usually see, so it's got to be readable, A, um, and you don't necessarily want to be tracking, you know, or maybe you do, like eight and a half, 11, or 11 by 17 sheets of paper on the wall. Um, quite often, um, when we build these visual management systems, um, it is really a token to represent that work and that detail. Uh, and then usually there's some link out, either an item ID uh, that links out to, um, you know, um, 
SharePoint for deeper documentation or Jira or Rally or some other, um, you know, some other place where that detail can be kept. I usually like to keep the detail relatively light um, in on the wall, uh, and then as more detail is needed, uh, you drill down on that in an electronic version. Okay. But finding the balance is key there. You need to figure out what what's too much and what's not enough. Definitely. Uh, we've got one more question if you got time. Sure. All right. Um, this one should be pretty simple. Do you use tacks on the sticky notes to make sure they don't fall off the wall? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 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 when we have corkboard, absolutely. Um, it's great when you can have, um, uh, when you either have cork or uh, magnetic whiteboards. Uh, so you can use a little, a little magnet to keep it on. Um, I, when I just have, uh, you know, a wall or a surface, if I'm doing it physically, then I quite often will add a little bit of uh, painter's tape, um, uh, you know, just to make sure it, it doesn't, it doesn't drop off. But yeah, that, <laughs> that is one of those sticky details of, of, of building these things. Thanks, Bob. Sure. Okay, so um, so we build these things, and the tools are not uh, magic bullets, right? They're they're a way to to gain a little bit of transparency um, and to try to drive some of the interactions that we uh, want between people, so that they're able to um, uh, manage the work. Um, and uh, so. I'm gonna talk um, specifically about um, this portfolio alignment wall. And then I'm gonna talk about um, um, the cadence of meetings because that was a very important, just visualizing it is um, necessary, but, but it's creating the working uh, meetings around this that is critical for driving um, the, individuals and, and interactions to to make the trade-offs that were necessary so i'm gonna i'm gonna open up a pen um let's see what color is good uh let's try magenta um so our columns um were on this particular wall and this is just a particular implementation for this um what was a two week boundary. All of our scrum teams um, were using two week uh, sprints and they were all aligned. Um, and this is something that the Scaled Agile Framework does um, and LESS does. And, and it's really important when um, you're um, managing dependence, dependencies between Agile teams uh, that you you align the the sprints. It just it becomes um, really unmanageable, um, you know. To, and you get this this weird um, delivery schedule of dependencies between teams. We want the teams to be able to plan together, execute um, in parallel, and demo together. Now, I will say that this particular wall had six. Agile teams uh, that were delivering against this portfolio of work uh, and five waterfall teams. So I wanna be super clear that this sort of portfolio visualization is not just for Agile teams uh, and you can use it in a purely waterfall world. Um, and you can also um, use it when there's a, um, when there's, uh, you know, you're in a hybrid world where some of the teams are Agile and some of them are waterfall. Our rows um, going across were actually feature streams. And, and what that means is uh, any given row was really a customer product. And quite often um, those products need to touch many different teams and many different System. So the rows um, in in this organization were a particular um, a particular product that they were going to be selling. And on this wall, 
these 11 teams were delivering against 17 different um, feature streams um, that, uh, that ne they needed to deliver against. Uh, we also had um, uh, two different types of cards. We had these fluorescent green ones that were feature finalizers, um, meaning that this was these fluorescent cards were all releases to uh, essentially production. That's when the, the feature was ready to go into the release pipeline to get pushed out to production. Any other cards um, on the board, such as the, this grouping here, represented dependencies between teams. This, was, this board was used to plan feature releases and plan dependencies. So um, uh, it, that's sort of a critical thing to note. These are not user stories um, or particular, uh, you know, so a team might or might not have uh, work on this wall during any given sprint if they're not delivering a dependency. Uh, we'll talk a little more deeply about that as well. Um, on, uh, on each card, um, there was a little label down here in the corner. I don't know if folks can see that. Um, let me just use a pointer here. Um, are, are you able to see the pointer? Yep. Okay. Um, the labels in the corners represented a given Agile team. So this, these, th and there would be inscription on it. So the color helped you narrow it down, uh, and then they would actually have the team name on it. So um, these may, in fact, be all the same team uh, delivering dependencies into um, into uh, the integrated test environment. Um, and um, they might have four or five user stories in their uh, Scrum team, or they might have a milestone on their waterfall integrated master schedule that, that represented the delivery of this dependency into the integrated test environment. Now, we also had um, card colors. Um, you know, we talked about the card colors that represented feature releases. And you also see that we have some pink cards, some purple cards, um, some orange cards um, on the wall. And for this particular portfolio, um, the portfolio executive said, I need to be able to visualize um, the funding stream, uh, the, the line of business funding that is um, supporting this work. So the pink cards came from one funding channel. These light blue cards came from one funding channel. The purple cards, one funding channel, and the orange cards. And that was a key feature for them because as they step back and look at this wall, um, they can see those uh, colors from a distance. And they knew that some of the funding would run out uh, you know, at a certain time. So I don't know if this is true, but I can't see you know, none of the orange cards, if they roll over, the, maybe, let's say this boundary um, can be worked on because my, my funding may have evaporated. Um, so, um, so as you can see, uh, here's a little more detail um, on the cards. And there's interesting, for some of the cards, actually, let me get a different pen color. Um, for some of the cards, you'll actually see two teams on it. Um, so this one has two teams on it. Um, this one has one team on it. Um, these, these little flags, you know, this one, it looks like it's blocked. Um, those were some uh, data that you would, um, you would be able to see just from looking at the uh, wall from a distance. Now, the way most 
people interact with this depends on their goal. Um, so if a product owner uh, is coming in uh, and they want to, uh, or, or one of the program product people wanted to walk their stakeholders through what was being released, they would, um, they might come in and talk to them and say, this is what we're releasing, uh, you know, at the end of March, we'll get um, all of these things over here will be released, um, you know, in early, uh, early May. Um, so they might be talking at a release level and doing some basic release planning by trying to, you know, set out in the future where they wanted to try to get these features done. And you might have, um, say, this feature, and I'll, I'll change my color so you can see where I'm, I'm what I'm drawing. Um, so this feature right here might have um, this dependency that needs to get fulfilled and this dependency that needs to get fulfilled and this dependency that needs to get fulfilled and maybe this one. Now, we'd have to actually look at the, the dependency IDs, which were, were written on the card to say, you know, is that true that all of these are dependencies that need to be delivered? But this was a complex environment. We had, you know, front end work um, that needed to be done for the feature to get done. We had, um, you know, maybe uh, an API that needed to be developed um, and we had to get that done. We had to be able to check that off and say done, you know, done, done, um, as we were moving along in time. Um, so we can see from an executive level, they're looking at feature releases and funding. From a product portfolio management, they're doing release planning and walking stakeholders through when they'll get their stuff done. Uh, from a team level, they would be concentrating on um, looking a little more closely um, at this is, they might say, this is the sprint we're currently in. And they would have a cadence of meetings where they would say, uh, this one is done. This one is done. This has been delivered to the, um, to the integrated um, test environment. They might say, um, this one is blocked. We're not going to finish it this sprint, and we're going to need to move it to another sprint. And someone would say, in this meeting, they would say, shoot, this is dependent on uh, us finishing this is going to be dependent on getting this done. If what happens to this, can we pull it in in the sprint, or do we need to push this feature release uh, out to some future sprint? And it was in this meeting where we had team representatives, portfolio representatives, and portfolio executives in the meeting making those trade-offs. And it might be that we say, well, unfortunately, you know, we can't um, move that. So what we, so we can't move it. So I'm scribbling that out because maybe this one is, has a regulatory requirement that we need to meet um, in early April. So all of the teams would be there to say, what options do we have for pulling that in? And a team might say, well, I might be able to get this done if I don't have to do this and this, or they'd say, if we had help from this team that's represented by this green thing, we could get it uh, done and integrated uh, so that we could get this feature completed. And they would actively make those trade-off decisions in the meeting. And it is moving from direct to status only to creating a working session cadence around this wall that is the important thing. 
Yes, the visualization helps us understand where stuff is. Yes, it allows us to see if we've got too much stuff uh, going on concurrently. Uh, yes, it might help us limit WIP, um, but uh, we need, whoops, we need to, um, uh, it is the people in the meetings to say, that are required um, to say, you know, this sprint looks too busy. This is a lot of stuff going live. Um, you know, can we pull some of that back? Do we push it out? Um, are we actually okay? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes it is no, we've got way too much stuff in this sprint um, dependencies that we need to deliver. We don't think we'll be able to make it all. Let's rebalance our portfolio. Um, so what are the advantages? Well, it's it, the physical walls um, are, you know, they're a lightweight tool uh, to make change easier. It's a lot easier to do brainstorming by moving stuff around uh, on these walls. Um, you can um, visualize the plan itself. Uh, you want to create not only the wall, but the cadence of processes around them. They're highly visible. A lot of organizations have these up in their halls. So if anybody wants to see what's on the portfolio, it's not hidden in some Microsoft project plan somewhere. Um, they, the physical presence and meeting cadence around it improves accountability. We can't just say 99% done, 99.5% done, 99.6% done uh, in status meeting after status meeting. We actually have to, we have to say, we're not going to get this done. I need to physically move this card in the pre presence of all of my peers and the portfolio team. So there's quite a bit of accountability and visibility that's created. Um, and the problem solving sessions are much easier because uh, they're in person. You've got a physical wall that you can kind of brainstorm. How might we move stuff around? to be able to bring things in um, because there's always, um, in any portfolio this complicated, there are always issues and problems that need to be solved. Um, so we had, um, you know, um, a typical agenda for these meetings. Um, you open it up, they're usually not, uh, these are more like longer scrum of scrums or working, planning working sessions, typically, most portfolio alignment walls, um, the cadence is twice a week. Sometimes it's once a week. Sometimes it's uh, more more often. But if there if the the organization has a lot of things changing dynamically, but um, just like a scrum of scrums, you might have scrum masters. You might bring product owners. You might bring tech leads. Whoever you need to the meeting, you review any action items for previous meetings. The teams walk through uh, and update the current sprint that they're in, or if they need to move stuff around in the future. They do that in the meeting so that every there's high visibility as to what changes are happening in the portfolio, uh, so that people can mm, realize uh, and or bring up um, uh, issues uh, that might arise from those changes. Review any roadblocks um, and status. Uh, you know, by major release or 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 uh, feature set, uh, review any new items that are getting added to the board, um, uh, so that you have the whole team there looking at it. Now, in the in that particular one, um, and I'll go back to this. We had uh, Tuesday uh, tended to be more working session for the teams. Uh, and it was more of a stand-up where they would, uh, each team would go through their current um, sprint or for the waterfall teams, their current time period, um, update any um, milestones, let people know if things were blocked, if they needed help, um, or if they were on track to get something done that sprint. Uh, and then they might update things that are in the near future. Um, you know, the next upcoming sprint or two um, in the Tuesday meeting. And then the Thursday meeting had a broader range of stakeholders, including the executive who had full scope authority uh, and budget accountability and authority 
over the program. And that's where sort of major trade-offs um, would happen if we needed to move stuff around, uh, we could ask uh, and essentially get sign off on that change um, in that meeting. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's another key thing. You wanna have delegated scope authority, delegated budget authority in this meeting on some cadence because this is where change management uh, can occur. And you know, a lot of those trade-offs are, are not, you know, they're not happy times. It's like, shoot, we're gonna blow this release um, what are we going to do? Um, uh, but uh, we tried to turn it into a working session rather than just a status session with the working sessions done offline. Um, so um, focus on done done, not fuzzy incremental uh, progress. Time backs the conversations, just like a stand-up. We tried to keep these at a half hour. Um, you know, uh, don't do big problem solving in the meeting. Figure out who needs to be there. Schedule an after meeting um, get together to do the big problem solving, and then bring that back to the group during the next um, the next paw review. Um, Ensure that there's cross-functional representation. Um, you know, usually there's um, scrum masters from the team, team members, key stakeholders. Quite often, portfolio teams um, working across the team, such as architects. Um, um, you might have a a um, release train engineer or a sort of a cross-program. Uh, scrum master that facilitates this meeting. You know, you need to figure out who are the folks that need to be in this meeting to make it not only effective, uh, but also ensure that the right um, eyes are 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 on this uh, this change. And that could be external stakeholders, could be line of business representatives. You need to figure out for your context, for your portfolio, who needs to be there. But typically. Um, you know, it's scrum masters of PMs uh, and team members from each of those uh, subsequent teams are, are sort of the, the minimal starting place for this sort of um, portfolio wall uh, and portfolio review process. Um, you know, if you if it's a larger portfolio, you'll have one chief scrum master, um, you know, uh, uh, a master scrum master, release train engineer, whatever you want to call them. Uh, portfolio scrum master, um, you know, uh, facilitator, a, a rose by any other name, but someone to facilitate this meeting to um, follow up on um, impediments uh, to make sure that um, if there's reporting or escalation that needs to happen out of this meeting that that stuff gets done. Uh, they don't need to be necessarily responsible for uh, that reporting um, or escalation, but but someone has to track and make sure it has been done. Um, and uh, somebody from the team that represents the dependency. Now, um, they can be uh, representatives and it is nice to have one strategic product or portfolio owner that is there um, that can make cross team um, trade-offs uh, and, uh, and sort of you know, might be the like the product management team in Safe 4.0 or 4.5. Now, I did want to talk about one um, thing that I, I didn't cover. We really focused in this meeting on done done and not incremental progress. So for this particular wall, done meant a dependency was delivered by this yellow team. Uh, you know, that yellow, um, whoever that was, uh, that little yellow sticky that represented the team uh, was delivered into the integrated test platform. Uh, and the team that was dependent on that part of the system, that piece of code, that new data design, whatever, whatever it was that was being delivered by them, the other team or teams had validated that they could hit it and they'd done a basic test on it to ensure that it was what they expected. So in this, on, on this wall, 
Done didn't mean works on my box. It meant delivered to another team that could validate that that dependency had been met. And if it's not done, it is not done. So even if you're 99% done and the end of that sprint period um, came, it needed to roll over. Obviously, we wanted to know about that uh, as, as early as possible. But try to make move from incremental progress reports. You know, that, the teams can manage that. They can manage their percent complete on the waterfall plan or uh, do we have all the stories done? Have we done internal testing of that dependency? They can manage that. Um, this portfolio is not to micromanage the teams. It is to understand critical path, um, understand when features are going to be ready and when milestones or dependencies are going to be met. Now, you could uh, certainly track other stuff uh, on a board like this, uh, and many uh, organizations have tracked particular, um, maybe features within a team uh, rather than just dependencies. Um, but um, here for this portfolio, there were just so many dependencies that needed to be completed before any given feature could be released to the public. So um, we use this to track dependencies. And this is very much like, um, you know, the PI planning board that you'll see in SAFE. Um, and actually, um, Arlen Banks and I published an article on portfolio alignment walls uh, in about 2005. Um, and I, I think some of the work that we have done, uh, you know, have been mirrored by many, many um, agile teams um, delivering in large programs. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not claiming that we invented the internet, but, um, you know, uh, as far as I know, we were the first to sort of publish the, the, um, the strategy for, for developing and using portfolio alignment walls um, in, in an agile context. These sorts of things have been in lean organizations for uh, a very long time. Uh, we just kind of brought it up to the, above the team uh, portfolio level. Um, digital options. Uh, uh, so many teams use both physical and digital tools. Uh, if you can do, if you are co-located or the majority of stakeholders are co-located, a physical wall, uh, I believe, is best because it is, you get that meeting huddled around the wall and it is much easier to move stuff and you're not, um, it's not a whole bunch of people focused on a screen. It's people focused on a board and quickly turning to have the conversation with their peers, individuals and interactions. Now, if you have a completely virtual uh, organization, then digital tools um, are great. There are not a lot of great options uh, for, um, for digital, for layout and, and flexibility. We really like uh, at Lightspeed, we use LeanKit. Uh, we use it quite a bit um, because it provides uh, us a great deal of flexibility of card color um, icons on uh, on the cards. Uh, rows and columns can be pretty much um, created at will. So you're not tied to a particular view of a portfolio that's out of the box. Um, uh, and so... Um, digital is definitely an option. Um, what we did um, when we had this board, um, they literally would create um, a, um, um, they used Visio to create a copy of this and we had admin support to be able to create a copy of, seen other people use PowerPoint, I've seen other people use uh, things like LeanKit um, or even Microsoft Project um, to, to sort of visualize this. Um, but it is a lot harder once it's electronic to move stuff around, keep the links in, um, in, intact. Uh, it, not, it's not harder, it just takes more time and people are focused on the tool rather than uh, the conversation. That really is what the important part of these portfolio uh, alignment strategies. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, and uh, obviously uh, here at Lightspeed, we, uh, we do a ton of 
agile work, uh, we would love to come into your organization, help you design a visual management system, set up the cadence um, around that. We do team coaching, training, and blah, blah, blah. You'll get the sales pitch from, uh, from us in our newsletter at some point. So I'm sure you'll have time to take a look at that. I am uh, Bob Payne. Uh, and I want to say hi and uh, take some questions. Thanks, Bob. That was great. Um, we definitely have a handful of questions here. Um, but before we get to that, I will do my little thing here. Um, so I just wanted to thank you guys all for attending the webinar. Um, apologize for the date change there, uh, but we're glad that you were with us. We hope that you enjoyed everything that you learned today. Um, and if you're interested in joining our next session, it's on January 26th, um, and that'll be with Mario, Sylvia, and Raj and Dougal. And we'll kind of be navigating um, the certifications out there and what they mean for 2018. So and there's um, Mario and there's Raj. There you go. <laughs> like we're all we're all good now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, details on how to register will come to you after we close here. Um, and if you are interested in signing up for uh, an upcoming webinar, but you don't want to wait around for um, the follow-up email or a webinar newsletter, then everything is on our website. Um, just go to lifespeed.com and click on the Lifespeed webinar series, and you'll be able to see all of our upcoming dates and all of our previous published webinars as well. Um, we did just conclude the Agile Leadership Academy's second session of the year and are already planning for our third session. It's in uh, March. It'll be March 12th and 13th. Um, and that one, which will focus on um, uh, lead product management and design, will include a site visit to a company that's currently practicing Agile, um, a full day workshop, networking opportunities, some really delicious food, um and you know other other things as they come along there and bob bob is one of our awesome agile leadership academy coaches um so for more details on registration for that will come to you in an email following the close here um and in events land we are already preparing for lean agile 2018 which is our niche conference it's a one-day affair two tracks of awesome content um, and next year's theme is Agile Engineering and DevOps. So if you're interested in learning more about those topics, definitely check us out. Um, you can check out last year's highlights at leanagiledc.com and give us a shout at lsevents at lifespeed.com if you're interested in speaking or sponsoring for next year. Thank you, Stephanie. You are welcome. And with that, I will get on to these questions here. Excellent. So the first one, um, do you have any advice on ensuring the wall and the electronic system are kept in sync? Um, uh, yes, uh, and in fact, um, let me, I'll, I'll, I can actually show you what we did. Um, um, so the, one of the rules was that you couldn't make a change um, on the wall uh, until you were in the meeting. And we put these little dirty flags on here. This meant the position of the card chain, they were those little sign here tabs. The position of this card or details on this card have changed. Um, we had the admin uh, support um, to keep the tools in sync. Uh, and the person that was responsible for that was in each meeting. Um, and then they would also go through and periodically audit uh, if the if the two were were in sync. The good news is, you know, there were not, you know, there for the whole year there were a ton of data points, but usually we were only working uh, in a small area of the the portfolio alignment wall at any given time. Whoa, that's a really lousy drawing, you know. But maybe three or four, maybe five columns. Uh, might be areas where we're actively making changes. So every time we, we would make a change, we'd put a little um, one of those sign here stickers on it. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, the electronic version was updated. The physical version was considered the system of record and the electronic version was the backup. Um, so, um, and there was usually a, you know, some lag, you know, like a day lag between uh, when details would change here and when the electronic version would be 
would be updated. Gotcha. All right, next question. Does feature streams mean features as they are incrementally delivered? Yeah, so um, on this particular wall, um, these were actually different product lines. So it was a stream of features um, for a given, uh, a given application or a given customer experience. Uh, so maybe, and, and I don't know for, I don't remember specifically, but maybe this is an electronic, um, you know, portal to view uh, information on your account. So all of these green cards would be different features that were released into that website or that mobile application, whatever that customer experience was. Um, and in fact, um, I, I know for a fact that some of these streams were internal systems, like, um, uh, you know, this might be a feature for the um, customer service agents to be able to, um, you know, improve their ability to pull up information when they're on a phone call with a customer. I don't know if that particular feature stream was the customer service one without the labels on the on the um, that we had on the left for those feature streams, but they were features that were aligned to a given user customer experience or system to system interaction. Now, that happened to be for our board. You can you can sort of design this in 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 many different ways. I've seen some portfolio alignment walls where the rows were particular teams. Uh, and what they were plan, you know, major features they were planning on delivering. Um, so you can really design these uh, rows and columns uh, to suit your need. And and I often tell people build a few prototypes um, and kind of you know um, go through some mock scenarios and see which 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 portfolio alignment structure best suits your organization and team's needs. All right, thanks for that detailed answer there. Um, next question, creating a PAW would be completely new to our organization. What are your suggestions for where to start? Um, I, I would actually get um, some flip charts, uh, you know, the, the newsprint paper, um, and I would get the little tiny, um, um, I would get the little tiny post-its uh, and just create several different, types of uh, portfolio alignment walls and maybe take an old um, you know his historical plan or or a plan that you currently have and represent it on those different structures like what if we used months across the top for the columns what if we use two week windows what would our plan look like what if we use string to represent the dependencies what would that look like um, uh, what if we use different um, card color to represent team or card color to represent a given system that was being affected? What would that look like? Um, and then just walk some stakeholders through that those different designs, uh, ask them what questions they would want to have answered. So always start with the outcome in, the, uh, in mind, like what do you want to answer? Uh, what uh, things do you want to drive uh, using this portfolio wall technique uh, and then prototype some possible representations um, uh, and just walk walk through it with the team. Um, you know, for the snarky sales answer, um, it would be, uh, you know, call us in and we'd be happy to help. But, but you know, really start with the outcome in mind um, and then prototype uh, before you build the whole thing out because um, you're going to, realize that certain design elements are going to be more beneficial to your your team than others. And, you know, not to sound too salesy as well, but do you, Bob, recommend having a coach present to kind of start this process? Or do you think that teams can kind of navigate themselves? If, if there's enough, if there's a depth of agile um, experience within an organization, uh, then, you know, by all means, uh, take a crack at it. Um, a coach can be helpful, um, but most coaches don't sort of specialize in this sort of visualization. So, you know, even if, you know, I'm more than happy to answer a phone call uh, if folks, um, if, if, if you want to shoot my 
uh, my phone number out after this webinar is contact information, email and um, phone. I'm happy to you know, have a chat um, if folks are out there and want to design one, have a little more in-depth chat. But certainly, you know, if you're, if you're trying to um, change the way the portfolio is governed, the way the cadence of meetings, um, who needs to be in attendance, um, effective facilitation of this sort of meeting. If you don't have the agile experience at, uh, at this scale, it might be helpful, um, you know, to bring a coach in. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, next question. Is there a way the PAW could be leveraged to assist organizations with their prioritization of projects? Absolutely. Um, uh, so we go back a little bit, because um, this, uh, this wall was developed uh, and was tracking whole projects. Uh, this is also tracking whole projects in flight. Um, so each of the stickies doesn't represent a dependency. It's a whole bundle of work uh, that is in flight um, and where it lies in the, uh, in the sort of planning process. So it's a slightly different problem to solve. And sometimes people will have um, different indicators for different purposes. Like they might have work intake uh, represented in this way uh, in their portfolio um, planning area, uh, and then they might have something like this for execution. So there's sort of strategic planning uh, and then execution here, how are we laying the features out from those different projects as they flow through these uh, set of teams. Cool, cool. Um, all right, a couple more questions here. Does anybody take minutes, and how are the decisions made at the recording? Uh, oh, sorry, at the meeting being recorded. Uh, yeah. So um, for this particular, it depends on your need for those, but um, but I would recommend that, and that's one of the reasons that we had admin support in the room in the meeting, taking minutes if there were any decisions made or any um, major changes, such as moving a feature. Um, we definitely recorded minutes and chop those out to representatives that for for one reason or another we're not able to make the meeting. Uh, sometimes you have other stakeholders that are not in the meeting but have some interest in it, like a you know, possibly a PMO uh, if you're changing when features will be released, you might have to report that up to your uh, larger PMO. Um, when uh, when, I like it when um, you move from a separate PMO to this sort of portfolio working group to really an integrated agile PMO where the management of that, um, that PMO's work is done uh, visually so that you integrate the, the work and the reporting uh, in the same system. Okay, um, and I think this is our last question here. Um, stakeholder buy-in is obviously crucial, especially when uh -huh. it comes to the release plan. Um, in your experience, does a PAW make it easier to gain that buy-in? Uh, it, it allows <laughs> them to see the amount of work that's going on. It allows them to come in and say, if we want to add this feature, um, or if we want to pull this one in, we're going to need to, to move stuff out. It sometimes makes the trade-off a little more palpable um, to them. Um, but there again, you can you can lead the product people to data, but you can't force them to um, think or to agree with your your analysis. Um, but sometimes the visualization does help, um, uh, and it's one of the reasons that you see. Um, Brainstorming of plans quite often happens um, in uh, in some sort of physical format first. Like you know, uh, you know, imagine you were in a portfolio and they said we would like to add a whole bunch of more stuff out here, and you're like, uh, we're full, right? You know, uh, we're crazy busy uh, in October of 2008, so there's no more, there's not anything more we can take on. All right, well, I hope that that helps. Uh, thank you guys for sending those questions in. And if you have more questions, um, both Bob and myself uh, will have our contact information in the email that's gonna follow here. 
And if you're interested in, you know, learning more about these topics, then um, obviously the, the webinar recording itself will come to you, but please feel free to reach out to either one of us or both of us. Um, and thank you guys so much for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you and have a great, uh, great rest of the week and happy holidays. Thanks, Bob.